this LNO effectiveness framework, which is effectively there are three types of tasks that you could do. You know, L tasks are leverage tasks, N tasks are neutral tasks, and O tasks are overhead tasks. So with L tasks, you get you put in X and you get 10x or 100x back in terms of you know whatever the goal or metric is. Neutral tasks, you basically they're break even. You get one or 1.1 x back. And overhead tasks are ones where you get less than what you put in back in terms of uh, the return. Now it turns out that for any individual, you know, at any level, you have to do tasks across the board. You can't just completely avoid O tasks. Sometimes you have to do them. But what I realized is that I was attacking each task with the same degree of attention, perfection. And without discriminating between tasks in terms of when my energy is high versus when it's low. And so a simple tactic I used, and I used to maintain a to-do list, I still do. A simple tactic I used to put this insight into action is that every task that I had on my to-do list, I would just prefix it with the letter L, N, or O, depending on my analysis of like what kind of task it was. And so just that simple gap between you know, deciding to do a task and just forcing myself to think, wait, what kind of task is it? Oh, it's an L task, right? Like, or, oh, it's an N task really made a difference in terms of how I attacked that task uh, during the day. And also when I attacked it and the degree of perfection uh, I pursued for it. Hi, I'm Jim O'Shaughnessy and welcome to Infinite Loops. Sometimes we get caught up in what feel like infinite loops when trying to figure things out. Markets go up and down, research is presented and then refuted, and we find ourselves right back where we started. The goal of this podcast is to learn how we can reset our thinking on issues that hopefully leaves us with a better understanding as to why we think the way we think and how we might be able to change that to avoid going in infinite loops of thought. We hope to offer our listeners a fresh perspective on a variety of issues and look at them through a multifaceted lens, including history, philosophy, art, science, linguistics, and yes, also through quantitative analysis. And through these discussions, help you not only become a better investor, but also become a more nuanced thinker. With each episode, we hope to bring you along with us as we learn together. Thanks for joining us. Now, please enjoy this episode of Infinite Loops. Jim O'Shaughnessy is chairman and co-chief investment officer of O'Shaughnessy Asset Management, where Jamie Catherwood is an associate. All opinions expressed by Jim, Jamie, and podcast guests are solely their own opinions and do not reflect the opinions of O'Shaughnessy Asset Management. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon as a basis for investment decisions. Clients of O'Shaughnessy Asset Management may maintain positions in the securities discussed in this podcast. Well, hello, everyone. It's Jim O'Shaughnessy with yet another edition of Infinite Loops. Today's guest, Shreyas Doshi, is like one of the coolest guys I've ever come across. I'll tell the origin story of how we got to know each other a little bit later. But as as I went to kind of look at at him and what he's achieved, this guy this guy is one of the what the tech guys say are you know the elite programmer, the elite designer. He's he's up there and he's worked with companies such as I don't know if you've ever heard of any of these, but I had never heard of them. But Stripe, Twitter, Google, I it sounds like kind of the B team there. Uh, just kidding. We have so much to cover. So welcome. Thank you, Jim. It's an honor to be talking to you here. So I want to start out, I, I mentioned origin story. I think it would be helpful for our listeners and viewers. If you just give kind of a, a brief overview of the trajectory of the journey of your career and and I also know that there's a really interesting point that I want you to hit as well, and how it contrasted with what younger you saw as what you really, really wanted to do. I think that's helpful for a lot of our listeners who tend to be young. Mm-hmm. Uh, so please. Yeah. So growing up, I grew up in India, in Bombay, Mumbai, and I grew up in a family of businessmen. 
every male in my family for many generations had started their own business uh, and usually from scratch because they had ups and downs so they did not have really the ability to you know get a whole lot of capital necessarily from their father or or grandfather and so i just grew up in an environment where the assumption was that you know yeah you're going to start a business you're going to start your own company and and so that's what i thought i would do eventually in terms of the chosen field for a while i thought i was going to be a french professor and do something with french i don't know what but but i ended up uh, you know being good at mathematics and science and what not and again in india at least during that time if you were good at mathematics you did engineering so i picked computer engineering i loved computers and enjoyed programming so that was a natural choice for me and then at some point of time you know after i finished college i moved here to the united states uh, for phd in computer science and then rapidly realized that academia and research wasn't for me and so i decided one month into my phd program i decided to actually just drop out and i sort of you know exited college with uh, with a, with a masters grad school with masters and i couldn't wait to you know work in the industry so since then i have worked at various technology companies i started my career as an engineer at some startups and larger companies and at some point i decided i wanted to get into this thing called product management and so around 2006 i got my first product management role at yahoo if if folks remember like you know back in 2006 yahoo was still in its better days it's not the yahoo of today google and yahoo were kind of neck and neck and i was very excited to work on consumer internet products and so thank you yahoo for giving me my break and letting me into this amazing wonderful field of product management and then since then worked at google and twitter and most recently at stripe and over the last year so i left stripe last year and over the past year i have basically been spending most of my time advising startups founders so you know i have kind of informally advised more than 100 founders usually growth stage companies i'm a formal advisor for about a dozen companies so and that's been a ton of fun as well now going back to what you asked earlier jim the younger me and how things worked out you know during my sort of years at yahoo and google also i was kind of obsessed with like eventually starting my own company i had some visa issues or whatever so i needed to wait for those to be resolved but when those were resolved one thing i actually realized is one i was now much older i was like 35 and so so i was just thinking about it a little more holistically life wise than just like oh yeah of course the only purpose in life is to start my own business which was me in the 20s and certainly in my teens so that sense of purpose grew a much broader but the other thing i realized is that part of what i'm seeking a large part actually of what i'm seeking i was already getting which is you know that mindset of like starting my own business and like that's why i've been put on this earth forced me or compelled me really to just think like an owner at every company every company i mentioned i just thought like an owner and it sounds ridiculous but even at google i like thought and operated as though i owned google right and i, I wasn't an employee of google i just owned google and can i again it's like i can take no credit for that myself it's not like i decided one day i'm going to do that it's just how i was wired and so i got a lot of satisfaction from that which then you know again in my mid 30s and late 30s i was like you know what it's okay if i don't start my own company if i don't start my own startup raise a bunch of funding etc all the things that i thought i wanted to do because i am getting to think like an owner i am operating like an owner i'm working on early stage products usually with great teams and what more can a person ask for wow so as somebody who has started now four companies the you you must realize how rare that mentality is if i could like employ only people who thought like owners it's it's literally night and day and and we're going to get into this further with some of your great threads on on twitter but this idea that i always see is like you if you can learn 
how to retain maximum agency. You can put a bunch of different names on it, but if if you can retain maximum agency, you're going to get so much further, no matter what your, your vocation or avocation is, right? It's such a critical part of not just succeeding, let's call it financially, but succeeding in life, succeeding with your family, succeeding with your friends. I, I know that you and I have talked about, you know, you the care that you put in to to your son who we were just talking about, which is is really great. And the, those things aren't hacks. There are no hacks in in understanding that. It really does come down to having the ability to self-assess, which is something almost none of us can do accurately, but then kind of learning like you did, like, huh, I've, I've got all of these things that kind of make me happy. Maybe I can just let go of that. That's evolution. And I applaud it. I want to, I want to talk specifically about the, your technique, the LNO effectiveness framework. You know, as you go through it, you're like, number one, brute force works early, but then really stops working. And, you know, you can, if you're a brute force thinker, you're going to, you're going to start out of the gates really, probably really well, but you're not going to, it's, it's a marathon. It's not a sprint. And Mm -hmm. at some point in that marathon, your brute force isn't going to work. The second thing you've said that I really enjoy because I I am always the exception to all of these things. I don't know what you would make of me, but that is your calendar speaks more truth than a to-do list. So I I don't maintain my own calendar. First off, I don't make to-do lists. So you're going to educate me uh, about both, I hope. And then this other one, which I've seen so many times, tasks are not created equally. (laughs) And it amazes me in the various companies that I've started or worked for that were not my company, how that sort of thing gets lost very easily. So if you would, for the benefit of our listeners, just take me through this because I went through it. It seems like an incredibly straightforward and amazingly helpful method of of being very, very productive. Well, Jim, yeah. So you know at some point in our careers what we find no matter what we're doing what we find is that we we can no longer just mess with time because you know as the cliche goes time is finite and everybody has the same time right so so at work you can roughly do three things with your time even in life you can number one elongate it and what that means is you work more hours Second is you save it. And what that translates to is you work efficiently. So you use tools and productivity hacks to become more efficient. And the third is you leverage it, which is you work on stuff that matters most. And so one of my observations, especially after I became a parent, is that having kids is great because you just rapidly hit the limits of the first two right? Like you rapidly hit the limits of elongating time because you cannot work more hours possibly. You have a human being to look after and you, you, you've already tried all the time management hacks for being more efficient. So you can no longer save time, right? So the only choice you're left with is leveraging it, which is working on stuff that truly matters, right? And so out of desperation, becoming a parent forces you to get really good at the third one, which is leveraging it. And, um, you know, as, as I was kind of, you know, starting out in my product management career early years, this was at Google, I had my, my son was born my, three weeks into my tenure at Google. So I joined the company and then I was like, okay, bye-bye everybody. I'm going to go on a couple of weeks paternity leave. And, you know, so it was the first year of my child's life, first year as a parent for me, and first year at this very high performing company where, frankly, in the early days, I just felt like I was 
you know, I was out of place. Everybody was just more intelligent than me. They just knew more than me, et cetera, et cetera. And yet here I was an, an extremely ambitious person who wanted to do really great work, very conscientious. And so I had an extremely stressful couple of years during my time at Google because I was constantly feeling behind and I, I was working very hard, but like, I just did not feel like I was accomplishing enough, you know, either at work or at, at home. Now, of course, it turns out during those years, I was constantly getting promoted, like much quicker than most of my peers. And yet that external signal somehow did not really make any difference to my own score of how I should be doing and how I was kind of like falling short of the expectations that I had of myself. So every day I would come back home and I'd chat with my wife and I'd just tell her about how stressed I was and incredibly stressful as was like sleep issues, various other issues. And the LNO framework, which like I read about it in some, I read about the ideas behind it in some blog posts, which like, you know, I can't actually, unfortunately can no longer find, but it kind of formed the basis, the ideas in there formed the basis of this LNO effectiveness framework, which is effectively, there are three types of tasks that you could do. You know, L tasks are leverage tasks, N tasks are neutral tasks and O tasks are overhead tasks. So with L tasks, you get, you put in X and you get 10 X or hundred X back in terms of, you know, whatever the goal or metric is neutral tasks. You basically, they're break even you get one or 1.1 X back and overhead tasks are ones where you get less than what you put in back in terms of uh, the return. Now it turns out that for any individual, you know, at any level, you have to do tasks across the board. You can't just completely avoid O tasks. Sometimes you have to do them. But what I realized is that I was attacking each task with the same degree of attention, perfection, and without discriminating between tasks in terms of when my energy is high versus when it's low. And so a simple tactic I used, and I used to maintain a to-do list, I still do. A simple tactic I used to put this insight into action is that every task that I had on my to-do list, I would just prefix it with the letter L, N, or O, depending on my analysis of like what kind of task it was. And so the, just that simple gap between you know deciding to do a task and just forcing myself to think, wait, what kind of task is it? Oh, it's an L task, right? Like, or, oh, it's an or N task really made a difference in terms of how I attacked that task you know, during the day. And also when I attacked it and the degree of perfection I, I pursued for it, right? Like, and again, I, I was like, you know, the strong inner perfectionist who like resisted you know, doing a less than perfect job on something. But rapidly, as I kind of started putting this framework in place, I was able to get myself to be less of a perfectionist with N tasks and O tasks and, and, and therefore save time, right? Like, you know, I would like, in, one thing I say is like, for people like me, you should try to actively do a bad job on N tasks and certainly O tasks, like, because you're actively trying to do a bad job will actually be a pretty decent job anyway. <laughs> so, and so, so, so by doing that, what you end up doing is you end up focusing yourself on what really matters and you end up creating more time for that. So the point here is not just like work fewer hours. It's the point here is, as you understand what the N tasks and O tasks are, and as you attack them with the kind of quality that they require and they warrant, you end up saving a lot of time. And that time you are now free to apply uh, to doing an even better job on the L tasks. And as I, and of course, this wasn't an overnight thing, but like, as I put this in place over a year or two, that was life-changing for me because, you know, the stress was gone because at the end of the day, I could keep a scorecard of like, did I get my L task done, right? Like I was still ambitious. So I had a lot more things to do than I had time for, but the satisfaction of having checked all my L tasks was just freed me to go home and not have to stress out about, you know, the job I did and the job that's ahead tomorrow. And just to help me to also be just like much more present in the evening with my family and whatnot. So those are some ideas around the LNO framework that like, as I put in practice, it like drastically changed the way I approach my work and really ended up increasing my effectiveness. Yeah. I think that one of the things that I admire about that is 
any thinking that you can bring to a task or a problem you're facing that can clarify uh, sort of automatically is useful, or at least I have found. Because what happens in your case, you're devoting all of your energy to, to the leverage tasks. Sometimes we don't even think about these things. So number one, I applaud the fact that you did give it some thought. But, you know, you had a, a, another thing that I've just flipped to. I was going to talk about it later, but this seems like a good time to talk about it. There's a big difference between being smart and wise. And th there is almost in human OS, our base programming says default to authority, consistent, if it's consistency without questioning it, that's always been done that way, et cetera, all the bromides. And, and you did a really great piece on it, talking about how you need to be the antithesis of, <laughs> of yourself when dealing with yourself, but that you need to also understand that that isn't the way the world perceives things. And I, I kind of smiled because in it, you, you were talking about char charismatic people have undue influence. And you, you're absolutely right. And it's, it's not an obvious thing to try to disambiguate how much of the charisma is actually getting the focus put here, how much is the is the vision or the idea. So talk a bit about that, if you will, because I think it's also just such a, a refreshing, at least to me, way of understanding that A, I've got to understand how the world works, right? As you delineate in, in your presentation of it, but I've got to figure out a way, the antithesis, right, of, of not getting like blown away by these charismatic people. Please uh, elaborate my poor execution of it. The antithesis principle, once I understood the idea behind it through just like introspection, it really changed my approach to a lot of things, particularly leadership. And I think it is best explained via an example. So let's take an example. So I think everybody's heard of this, this kind of, you know, this statement that I don't know if it's true, but like people say that, you know, people will form an impression of you within the first seven seconds of meeting you. Right. And so Again, I don't know whether or not that's true, but for the sake of discussion, let's assume that within the first seven seconds of meeting you, people form a solid impression of who you are, right? Let's assume that's true. Now, so what are we to take away from this, right? So one of my observations is that like when we encounter a statement or a hypothesis, you know, the, the foolish one will likely learn nothing from it, okay? The smart one, will learn one thing from it. And the wise one will actually learn two things. So, so let's, let's put it in practice here, right? So the foolish one will likely not really change anything or you know, address anything when they hear about this, about the first seven seconds. If you're smart, then you will say, okay, in order to be effective, I should con consciously try to create a good first impression on other people. That's the obvious conclusion, right? I'm smart, so I'm going to try to create a good first impression on other people. But that's where most people stop. And it's interesting to observe that actually, there is one more conclusion we need to make from this, which is we should not be a person who forms a fixed impression of somebody based on the first seven seconds. So that's the non-obvious conclusion, right? And that's what the wise one will also sort of conclude and absorb. And so there is this kind of antithesis here, right? There is this kind of polarity here around what do you need to do in order to succeed out there in the world? And sometimes you have to accept certain truths about the world, about the way the world operates, right? The world is not perfect and people have biases. And at times in order to be effective in the world, you need to recognize those biases, right? Another example I'll use here is, you know, I think a lot of us have seen or heard that, you know, 
if you want to help people learn something, people learn something much better if it's entertaining and engaging, right? So like, that's just, again, let's assume that's true. Then again, if, the smart one will take away one thing, which is if you want to help people learn something, look into making it engaging and entertaining, right? Like if I want to you know, teach something, if I want to help people learn, better make it entertaining, engaging, because that's going to increase odds of effectiveness. But again, there's that second thing we need to learn from this, which we should apply to ourselves, which is somewhat the antithesis of the first thing, which is it is actually not in your best interest to be the kind of person who can only learn from entertaining content, right? And nor should you be the kind of person that needs any sort of entertainment as a prerequisite for learning. Because if you can absorb that and implement that, then you will be way ahead of like, you know, 90, 95% of the people because you'll just end up learning more, right? You'll end up learning from these like amazing books that nobody's read because they don't have a, a great title, right? Or they were not written by a very famous person as just one example. So I find that this antithesis principle keeps coming up in all sorts of scenarios. One last example I'll use is you know, it is well known and like you'll read on Twitter all the time that, you know, to, to, to set the foundation for a good career, you should seek a great manager, right? A great manager is really important for you to make a great career. And so in your next job, you should always seek a great manager. Well, yes. And so from that, the two conclusions I draw, if I kind of, you know, stay true to the antithesis principle is that if you are a manager, you should try to be a really great manager because then others will want to work for you. Great people will want to work for great managers. And so, so you should try to do that. But if you are looking for a role, and especially once you've reached a certain level and a certain level of proficiency in your craft, in your profession, you should actually not make having a great manager one of your top criteria. Now, Jim, if I wrote this on Twitter people would just completely destroy this tweet, right? Like, it's like, what do you mean? Like, no, great manager is so important, et cetera, et cetera. But, but people miss that actually, you know, life is about trade-offs, right? So when you reach a certain level in your career, a certain level of proficiency in your craft, a great manager is actually should not be among the top five criteria for why you take a role. Now, the other thing, Jim, is people are also often, most people are kind of binary thinkers. So when I say you should not necessarily seek a great manager or, you know, as the main criterion for the next role you take, they automatically, they don't hear that. What they hear is that terrible managers are okay to work for. That's what Shreyas is saying. But I'm not saying that because there is an infinite set of points between a great manager and a terrible manager. So what I am saying is explore that unexplored infinite space instead of just fixating on finding a great manager for yourself because odds are that maybe you end up then working for a company that doesn't grow as well for whatever reason, right? So instead, look for culture, look for company growth. And in, in some cases, when you find those things, you may have to sacrifice on you know the manager stuff and that's okay. So anyway, those are just a few examples of where you know, and the way I kind of describe the antithesis principle overall is, you know, effectively what I say is you need to understand a certain thing about the world, apply it so you can be effective, but you, you may need to adopt the antithesis of that to yourself. So you can be a wiser, kinder, happier, more effective person yourself. Uh, absolute agreement from me. And, you know, you hit on so many of my favorite points that I, I guess we could spend the rest of the podcast just talking about this. I was, I was very interested in the, in the pacing that you gave it because I felt like I was reading a verse from the Tao Te Ching. The, the stupid person will laugh at this. The smart person will get this. And then the wise person gets this. We'll get to the Daojing Dijing a little later because I think that we share a great love for that body of knowledge. And I, I started reading it when I was 18 and finally started figuring out what it was saying to me about 30 years later. Uh, so it is sort of an endless fascination with me and, and with you. You also, what I like about you 
Shireas, is that you are very good at taking that extra step, right? And and by that I mean like to realize. Now, if I put this on a tw- Twitter thread, people are going to go nuts, right? Because for the most part, unfortunately, people are label thinkers. They default to the whatever your base programming is. You know, I have tried to contribute with things like the thinker and the prover and a whole variety of trying to get people to understand that we live in a probabilistic world and it's neither yes or no. It's a, you know, I always joke that between a yes and a no, there's always a huge maybe. And I think that that having that sort of default as your worldview can can be very helpful to you. But you had another thing that I which I particularly like because you hit on some of my little hobby horses that I want to take a flamethrower to. And and that are these the you call them the apple pie lesson. And briefly, I, if I'm interpreting you correctly, it's like these these positions are staked out like motherhood apple pie and you know you just never ever question them because the the it's a planted axiom in the world of logic but i like yours better because i, I think people get that grok that better go through a couple of the apple pies where i believe and i think you believe you should put up a huge stink you should put up a huge fuss because they're it's, it's kind of like the not invented here syndrome right People aren't aware of how persuasive or pervasive, rather, that attitude can actually have on an entire organization. And and so I love the apple pie. You don't have to go through all of them. I'll tell you, if you if you don't hit the one that, that I would love to see a, a flame torch taken to, I, I will bring it up. But maybe talk a little bit about that. Yeah. And Jim, I want to mention Rory Sutherland and both of us are huge fans of Rory's thinking and his work. And I think one of the things we recollect him saying was that oftentimes an individual ends up making way better decisions than a group does for the same decision. And and I think Rory's point there was that as an individual, we are making a decision we are using instinct, we are using various experience, various, various inputs, but we don't necessarily have to then reframe it in terms of completely rational viewpoints. Whereas in a group setting, there is immense pressure to boil everything down to the rational logic, right? And if it cannot be bulletproof, then it is not a decision that we want to make, right? And so therefore groups end up making at times much worse decisions. And and I think at the root of this in organizations, I'm a, I'm a huge student of like just organizational behavior. And so I've often noticed that like very capable companies and extremely capable teams, these apple pie positions come up, right? Like which are positions where the personal risk for an individual of pushing back on what is said is so high that in a meeting, everybody nods yes, even though it may not actually be the right answer for the team or the company or your customer, right? And so let's take some examples. So before I take the example, I'll make the observation that when an organization gets sufficiently large, one of the chief implicit goals of nearly every participant or employee in the organization is to sound smart in meetings, right? And so, so, and the way that starts manifesting is, Jim, imagine you and I are having a conversation about a difficult, a very intricate kind of problem related to a customer or a business problem. And obviously each of us has a model and we build a model in our head of like what the world is, what, what the reality is, what the truth is. And then based on that model, devise solutions to address the problem. And then we might, you know, you have a different model than me and we use our models to come up with, you know, different solutions perhaps. And then we discuss the solutions and we, we converge or arrive at what seems like a compelling solution. Now, that's a conversation between you and I. Now, let's, let's add a third person in, in, to the mix. 
And let's say there were like, you know, 10 other people listening, including some really important people at the company. Okay. This third person, if this third person wanted to sound very smart, right, they can ask a very simple question, which is, do you have any data to support that? That's it. Right, right now, all of a sudden, by asking that question and stating those few words, this third person has elevated themselves in the eyes of the group. And all of this happens like, you know, under the surface, we are not even aware that this is going on. Right. In fact, you and I will feel a little stupid, right. That like, we don't have a bulletproof answer readily available yep. for this question. Yep. Right. And so it affects everybody, everybody concerned that is an Apple pie position, right? And the reason it's an Apple pie position is I'm not saying data is bad, but I'm saying that oftentimes these questions that are essentially aimed as making, making us look smart and seem smart are unnecessary. And in fact, if we address them, we might actually be harming the mission than helping it, right? Because the fact is that like, you cannot produce data for every single thing, right? And, and so that's specific to this few other Apple by positions is we need to define the success metrics for whatever it's being discussed, right? So like, again, you and I are having a discussion, we agree on something. And then if a third person wants to sound smart, they can just come in with, so what are your success metrics for this? Right. You know, another one is, you know, like oftentimes people kind of use the, you know, use executives as kind of the shield, which is, you know, I don't want to like, I am not in agreement with what you're saying. I don't want to express that agreement very directly. So what I will say is something like, oh, well, we need all that is well, but like we need executive buy-in before we can <laughs> execute on this, right? So, so all of a sudden, a decision that was going to get made at this level amongst us peers, you know, what I did is I just said, we need more executive buy-in. And again, it's very hard to push back because you don't want to be the person that says, no, we don't need this, you know, uh, our, our CEO's buy-in because you are thinking, what if the CEO hears about that, right? Like, so, so now you're organizing a stupid meeting, which maybe you didn't need with the CEO and wasting the CEO's time. So uh, it keeps going on and on, right? Like we need, we need, we have too many meetings. I've seen this at many fast growing organizations. We say like, we have too many meetings. And then then when we remove some of the meetings, then people say, well, we need to sync more often because like we feel like we're out of sync, right? So you go into this endless cycle of like more meetings and then cutting the meetings and then starting them again. So, so those are just some examples of Apple Pie positions. And like I said, the personal cost of pushing back is so high that almost nobody does it. And so the, the only solution that, that really exists here uh, and I've tried this with, you know, actually implemented this on a couple of teams that I managed since I, you know, sort of like stumbled upon this observation is you, you, you add this to your team shared vocabulary. You make it okay to respond to somebody when they say we need more metrics before we can make a decision here as, well, that sounds to me like an apple pie position, right? Because like the moment it's a sanctioned part of your shared vocabulary, it all of a sudden reduces that embarrassment and reduces the fear of pushing back on an Apple Pie position, right? And then we can discuss, well, is it really an Apple Pie position, right? Like, because I didn't say it, it is an Apple Pie position. I said, it sounds to me like an Apple Pie position. So perhaps we can talk about it. Perhaps we don't need metrics here because it is not such a substantial decision and trying to collect metrics for something that is just inherently hard is just going to create more onerous process and onerous, like basically more work for us. So that's really the most effective technique I've found where a leader can kind of get through to the organization, how, how to avoid some of the perils here. So what I love about this is you have effectively reframed what is happening everywhere, every organization, and, and given permission with a cute name, the app, Apple Pie name, which I think is great. You've reframed it such that now it's okay. And you've given that permission explicitly. And, and it's so important 
like sometimes like for example my son and i are very similar in certain regards we're very different in other regards one of the areas where we're very similar is we would nuke every meeting that we can replace with a text or a zoom or a phone call and one of the things that i have observed in my anthropological mode of human os is that what you mentioned it when it, when a company gets too big what happens if if the person who's ultimately in charge doesn't notice it and prevent it is the executives of that company end up being in competition with each other and not with let's make a better product for our clients let's give them a better answer if we're a consultant let's do better in terms of the asset management it just works for every category and and then finally patrick again my son this week had ken stanley on who makes an impassioned case for the problem there's a reason why everyone knows or most people know the old saw about a camel being a horse designed by committee right and and the what what he points out is it actually gets more dangerous and it gets more dangerous because if we're looking at most of let's keep it on science or medicine if if we're looking for funding for our project our experiment our thesis what we have now is essentially a board of worthies right who are highly credentialed most of whom happen to have very very specific points of view about what is good science and what is bad science right and they probably tend to overlap somewhat and you as the the researcher trying to come up with a radical or different or out there idea or seeking funding we've got a mismatch here right because it converges right to the group the committee as opposed to diverging which is if you really want to find really interesting stuff you've got to be willing to go much further out on the tails in my opinion and and so that's risky it's risky for all of the reasons that you cite the apple pie i love it and and it's like it's one of the oldest argument forms right planted axioms you know like if all men are blue and socrates is a man socrates is blue well okay if we ex- if we accept the axiom that all men are blue then logically that follows right but all men are not blue and so the the idea you see this time and time and time again not only in business not only in presentations from inve- from people who want funding you see that planted axiom and then you like say well, what about this and i've often just seen people fold because they had so thought that that was right and another thing i learned in my many years in this business is anyone i'm asking questions from if they have an answer to every single one of my questions something's wrong and i will not <laughs> invest in them and i really mean that you know the that that resonates so much because i've made this observation in the past about certainty theater right because a lot of what's going on around us and this is not just in the business world i mean this is oh this is so common in news and current events where we're basically engaging in certainty theater right like everybody is certain about everything right like if you in business like for instance if i am at a high stakes meeting making a high stakes proposal my competence in most organizations the vast majority of organizations is measured by the degree of certainty i express for everything that i'm proposing right but but the fact is that there are so many things that we just don't know and and so so it gets gets back to your point about like if you ask somebody a set of questions and they have a well packaged answer for everything yeah you got a question what's going on there really yeah i this idea and i love that wording too the certainty theater I I was very very fortunate to learn that at a relatively young age because I was horrible I was a real proselytizer and you know this is the only way this is what this is why it's great this is why it's going to be like you know the best thing you ever did 
and and then I found myself in one of those kind of confrontational situations where the guy was really nailing me with a bunch of questions. They were good questions, by the way. And like, he finally got to one and I, I did something that I had never done before. I guess I was 38 maybe when I did this. I looked at him and I said, I don't know, but I will find out. And like, I got, I had like, it, I had this, when I was driving away from the meeting, I had this tremendous sense of like this huge burden coming off of me. And, and then I like really got into it because like, I don't know is sometimes the most powerful thing you can say, in my opinion, because like, I don't have opinions on most things. And, you know, Twitter, we're going to get into some of your cleverness there in a minute. But it's kind of like, I don't know. I don't know. I can find out or I think I can find out. But, like, I love this idea of certainty theater. And, you know, I'm having Will Store on, who's the poor guy. I've now read all of his backlists because I read his one's scientific storytelling. And then I read his The Status Game. Here is a man who has done deep dives on this stuff. And like it, 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 the interviews and everything, we are basically, you know, we are, well, let's put it nicely. We are domesticated primates. Mm -hmm. And, and essentially we have programming in us that like we spent a long amount of time in a tribe and it's been only a recent phenomenon where we haven't done that. And so those tribal instincts, certainty theater, because people believe if I don't come off as certain, I'm going to come off as wishy-washy, or I'm going to come off as not committed. And it, you know, you see it most in politics, which is an area where I won't even like even like look, because they've all descended in this emotional mind virus to their various camps. And all they're doing is they're non-player characters. They're just repeating the slogans that A, B tested the best. And I say this for both sides, by the way. Mm -hmm. uh, and and so, but you see it in business. You see it in when you're getting pitched on an, on an idea. And the, listen, I know just from my own life, there's a lot, like, there's a lot that's uncertain. There's a lot that you have to try to control for the variables, but there are some things that you've got to learn as they happen. And like I often say, and then I, I want to have you continue with this because it's a great topic, but like social media, I personally, I, I hold two opposing beliefs on it. The belief number one is that it's going to create the world's first 24 hour global intelligence network, the likes of which we have never seen because it isn't so much how smart my brain is or your brain is. It is the networked effect of all those brains that I find very, very intriguing. And I think becomes a massive variance amplifier. And we're doing a series on the whole thing. And I'm developing companies that are based on these principles. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's a big deal. And yet, I also believe that social media, it, unproperly curated, can be just a cesspool. And the unfortunate part of it is it becomes a cesspool for the people who haven't like gone through the, like you iterate, they haven't thought, oh, well, this, you know, maybe this is wrong. Maybe, maybe I shouldn't have an opinion on this. And because we're appealing to the emotional part. And like my day job is all arbitraging human behavior and human behavior is at its fundamental core, emotional. Most explanations are given post hoc mm -hmm. and they are given with a veneer of rationality. And, and so yes, social media can be a horrible, horrible place, but like I keep doing it because I think directionally, this is going to be like really amazing a worldwide intelligence network. Plus it's like everyone who works for infinite loops. I've only met one of them in real life and it was all proof of work. I didn't care where they went to school. I didn't care where they lived. I didn't care what color they were or sex or what their sexual preferences were. We make all of these things like their litmus to, I have an opinion mm -hmm. on that <laughs> and ba 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 ba. And like, you're excluding, what are you looking for? Do you want talent? Or do you want someone who looks just like you? So 
reality theater is like I'm stealing that directly from you and you're going to hear me saying that a lot because it is such a great phrase for what's going on like the news it's a Potemkin village like have you ever seen the gift where the reporter is rowing along in the in the rowboat and the guys walk behind her <laughs> and the water <laughs> and the water isn't even up to their knees right <laughs> and 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 like history people will know that Potemkin ran around in the USSR building all these village fronts so that all the dupe reporters that from the West would, when they sped by in their motorcade would say, wow, look at that. That's great. It's reality theater, TSA mm -hmm. reality theater. I mean, like it's like the, as, as one who am, I am amazingly thankful for the fact that I, like, I'm not running this podcast for anything, but like, here are some ideas. These are great ideas. Take the ones that you think you can run with. Reject the other ones. That's fine. I'm not trying to sell you anything. And what I love about you is you're not trying to sell anybody anything either, with the exception of you're, you're kind of like, you're kind of saying you, you really might want to look like over here. Because it seems to me, this gets me to the, uh, another thing that I wanted to talk with you about. And this is more under the life lessons but I was really struck by this. And, and you said, you know, when, when, you're, when you're starting out, things like high return on investment are kind of great. Like have a talent stack, have high agency, have clear thinking, do deep work, you know, do all of that stuff. But you are, if you're successful, you're going to get to a point in your career where you don't want to judge by just the return on investment at alone, because you know you're going to be presented with a lot of things that have a, a super high or reasonably high return on investment. You, you, what you want to do is you want to focus on minimizing the opportunity costs. Give us give us your your thinking on that because I was re I really thought that that was quite brilliant the way you put it. Yeah, once you reach a certain, again, a certain level of proficiency, a certain level of understanding and reputation in whatever your chosen field of work is. What you find is there are many opportunities that can provide a positive return of on investment. And this applies to certainly to individuals, but also applies to teams of people. And if we look at teams, most teams that I have encountered are essentially focused on creating that positive return on investment, right? And, and like, again, I have nothing wrong with, I want positive return on investment, obviously. But then what I, what I have seen consistently in action is that that desire then gets these teams of people to focus on quick wins, right? Things that I can do quickly that will generate a decent return, right? And, and so, so as I started looking at that, the first thing I did was like, okay, like what is the formula for ROI, right? So, and so that is, uh, you know, ROI is value created minus the cost of your time or cost of your resources, that divided by the cost of your time, right? So let's just say cost. So, you know, with any ratio, if you want to maximize that ratio, you can increase the denominator or you can decrease the, or increase the numerator, or you can decrease the denominator. Done right? with math. <laughs> right. And, and us being human beings, like, and the reality is that increasing the value of the numerator is usually significantly harder than decreasing the value of the denominator. So of course we choose the past path of least resistance and we say, okay, let's work on things that we can do quickly that will generate some return, right? So, cause like if you decrease the denominator, you're good. You have a high ROI. And again, there's nothing wrong with that. But what ends up happening is that many people and certainly many teams fill up that entire plate with these kind of ROI tasks uh, that provide you that positive ROI and they try to decrease the denominator. And then they work on things for like months, years, and you look back and you say like, okay, yeah, we achieved something decent, but 
like we're no longer the market leader <laughs> or we wanted to be the market leader why aren't we the market leader right and then in response to that question the team says yes let us figure this out and they'll do some research and they'll talk to customers and then they'll create another list they'll come up with another list in a spreadsheet and 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 then there'll be a few columns in the spreadsheet and one of the columns will be impact and it could be high medium low or whatever and then there'll be another column which is effort which is high medium low right and then they'll sort it and then they'll end up again working on the low effort stuff right again they're trying to you know maximize like or minimize the denominator to increase the roi what i found winning individuals and certainly winning teams do is that they do pay attention to roi obviously but their main kind of objective function is to minimize opportunity cost and so an opportunity cost is effectively you know the the value of the optimal option minus the value of the cho- chosen option right because any time you choose something you're you're precluding many other things you know you're you're not going to work on many other things when you choose to work on something and so 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 by trying to minimize opportunity cost we force ourselves to think about what is the optimal option right and and i don't mean to say that you should do the calculation it's actually not really possible to do an actual calculation sometimes people will say okay so should i create an opportunity cost column and like no don't do that it's not possible to do it like how are you going to do analysis of the value accrued over the next 5 10 years right like whatever number you come up with is going to be ridiculous and useless but we all know we all know the optimal options we are not pursuing and the reason we know those is because we know like if we are talented we know what's going to create massive value for the business or for our effort but we are scared to take it on we're afraid we're afraid because it's ambiguous and it is big right and we haven't yet taken the time to break it down in fact like again human psychology gets in the way of it and we we don't want to break down this big ambiguous goal because we might find that we don't know enough we might find we don't know enough about the business we don't we might find we don't know enough about our customers and we are just afraid to take that challenge on right so by uh, so that's why i say that in order to you know maximize your impact you your default thinking should be to minimize opportunity cost and yeah there will be certain other parts of work you do where you are also addressing roi and you are working on quick wins but if you're simply working on quick wins if you're not looking at what is the best use of your time and instead just asking yourself what is a good use of my time then you're not going to achieve the outsized impact and returns that you're hoping for yeah and what what i love about you is that you obviously have thought these things through very thoroughly and then your explanation is one with which even just regular folks can go oh yeah like you gave the example of that you're going to get the other excel line and i was i was off camera but i was snickering because i have seen so many of those brought into my office right <laughs> i'm like oh Oh, no 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 and 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 you also touch on something that i've been thinking a lot about recently because i've been helping with some people and and in in terms of like their careers and things and it's this idea of courage and like i never thought that i was being courageous writing books right i never thought i was being courageous putting my name on a firm and i did that because of the psychology of it if your names on that firm you're you're making a bold statement to the, your potential clients and that is i will risk my personal reputation on this and and yet the more i studied the more i understood truly understood that like who we're not bad at assessing other people we're horrible at self assessment myself included and so you know i didn't even start thinking about that oh maybe some people could be afraid <laughs> and 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 then i it kind of like flooded over and it's in terms of i'm kind of like trying to look at these things at from the mode of the infinite games going on down here 
And, and like, that's a huge one of them is this idea that how many great ideas get killed in their cradle by the creator themselves, right? That, that they don't even say, hey, what do you think about this? Now, I think there's some solutions for that. I think I can be offer some assistance with people like that. But it's it's truly like if you really, really, really want to do well in life and in your career and in your family and all of these things, study human beings. <laughs> because in nine times out of 10, you're going to see these things. They're going to become, they're going to scream at you when you're looking at other people, right? Tony DeMello has this great line, which is, if you want to find out what you hate about yourself, look at what irritates you and other people. And like, it's, there's a lot of truth to that. But, you know, there can also be kind of a, a, a cynicism that creeps in. Because you, you have another thing that I that I like and like really resonated with me. And it's this school versus life. And like I have a degree in economics because I promised my mother I would have one. That's the only reason I have a degree in economics. Because I saw all of these things that they want that school wanted to teach me. And I like I, I was just the guy in the back with my hand up all the time because I didn't believe any of it. And then you read guys like Robert Anton Wilson and he goes, look, society tries to program a correct answer into your brain. And it tries honestly to, to wipe out your creativity. And, and there's a lot of reasons for that, but take us through some of the, some of your observations on, on the school versus life, because people need to hear this. You are listening to a person who is very, very successful in what he's done. And, you know, like w- one of the, one of the things that I just immediately jotted down when I was reading it is like, and I can't get anyone to understand this. The Warren Buffett of 2040 is going to get there by a completely different path than our Warren Buffett got to where he is. So tell us some more about like school is teaching us the wrong things many times. Yeah. And it's, it's interesting that again, if you look at, you know, outsized returns in sort of any endeavor or any type of endeavor in business, you need some unique insight. And so by following other people's playbooks, like, it's it's a playbook for a reason. It's published. It's 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 out there, right? So <laughs> yes. by following other people's playbook, at best you can hope for if you don't screw it up is like average or slightly above average results, which is fine, right? Like I'm not here to say that that's failure, but let's not kid ourselves. Let's not kid ourselves that like just by following Elon Musk's Twitter account and you know dressing up like Elon Musk or Steve Jobs. Or reading, you know, the five biographies of an, a given individual, so you get an access to every angle of their life and early childhood. That's not going to make you Elon Musk. I'm sorry. Right. Um, and and I, I, think, I, I just have to interject. Like this yeah. triggers me, and I can feel myself getting triggered right now because you're articulating this so well. And and I came across something years ago. I think 2018. Somebody was doing exactly what you just did, but he, they they were trying to sell it. They, they were basically, and it was on the internet, and it was like, if you do these five things, you're going to be just like Elon Musk. And I just like lost it and <laughs> typed the entire tr- thread. I'll put it in the show notes. Like, no, <laughs> you're not going to be like Elon Musk if you do these five things. And it just really annoys me because there are people like you out there who are willing to say, hey, that that's bullshit. Think about it this way. So continue. Sorry for my outburst. Oh, no, it's like <laughs> it's, it's such an important topic because, you, you know, and some of it is related to what what gets you know taught in schools that, you know, the schools are very like generally fairly deterministic environments. Right. Like you do A and then you do B and then you do C and then outcome X appears. Right. And that's documented. 
right? Take the example of a rubric for some course you're taking, right? Like, you know, uh, many students will get upset if the teacher does not publish a very concrete rub rubric of like how your assignment is going to get graded and like what, what does great look like? What gets a 10 out of 10 on the assignment and what gets a 9 out of 10? And what's a five out of 10, right? And Jim, you know, I really like some of the ideas and I wrote a thread about this recently, but some of the ideas on this topic, I stumbled across as I was, you know, later in my career, as I was managing people who were much younger than myself. And uh, you know how they say like, you know, every generation is worried, irrationally worried about the next generation. I found myself <laughs> in that place. Where, right. and, and, the, and the prompt really for me was, when folks would come to me, people I managed or people in my org, and they would say, well, I need a clear rubric for how my performance is going to be evaluated. And, and I'm here right now. I want to be here in a year or two years. And like, what is the exact path that I need to take? So that was one sort of, I, I heard that often enough. I was like, uh-huh, that's interesting. I hadn't thought about it that way. The other sort of prompt for me to sort of stumble, which made me stumble across these ideas that I shared was that oftentimes, like I found myself being asked for feedback, which like sounds great, right? Like a person is asking for feedback, but I saw something interesting, Jim, which is many folks who had just come out of school, they were asking feedback for like on a very granular basis, they would, they said, I want real time feedback. Again, all of this sounds great. Like it's kind of like an apple pie position. Like, yes, give me real time feedback. And so what they wanted to know, like after they presented at some meeting, like, how did it go? Right. right? Like, you know, how, like, and it's not even like the, the, you know, meeting to the whole company or the CEO or anything. It's just some meeting. And, and how did I do? Right. Like, again, all of these things in isolation seem fine. Right. But here's one thing I realized when they were asking for real time feedback, I realized they were looking mainly for real time positive feedback and reinforcement. Right. And, and, and like I like the naive me, like, you know, did like basically told them what I saw as like in my eyes as the truth, which is like, I thought this was great. This is what I would do better. Here's why. What do you think? Right. And but that's not what they wanted, right? And they wanted that real-time positive feedback and they wanted to make a connection between that feedback and that longer-term trajectory. Like, how is this meeting and my performance at this meeting or my performance in writing this document or influencing this decision, how is that going to, you know, make me get to the next level, right? And, you know, call me call me old or old fashioned, like, but my observation is that like, there isn't like, you know, direct cause and effect with these things in the real world, in the business world, you know, you, you do a number of things, right? Some right. And some might be mistakes, but you can't really sort of try to extract value and signal out of every single thing you do every day. Cause you'd go crazy. Right. And so, and that's when I realized why this was happening. It was because of the rubric. Right. It was because of the, these were very like, obviously, these folks were very intelligent and they, you know, they had mastered the system, the education system. And so, so they were great at like understanding the rubric, soliciting the rubric and then following the rubric to a T. And that gave them A's, right? That landed them at Stanford, Harvard, whatever. Right, right. But like my observation is in business and life, there is rarely a rubric. And even if somebody's published a rubric, and you follow it to a T, you will end up with average results. <laughs> right. Because right. he published it or she published it. Right. And, uh, and so 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 what what I started guiding folks towards is look like your if you follow a rubric, I can share a rubric with you, but like your your trajectory is gonna look like this. My own trajectory has been like this. And what that has meant is to operate in a state of ambiguity, right? And, and sometimes to do things against the rubric. Right. So do you want to like I'm as your leader and manager, like you like I'm really genuinely presenting you two options. We can like pursue this trajectory or we can pursue this trajectory. Right. Like and the choice is yours and I will manage you accordingly. Right. And obviously, these since these were ambitious, highly capable, intelligent people, everybody chose this. 
right but and that what that did is it gave me the freedom to like at least share my perspective on when you know it makes sense to break a rule right because it's a, it's not okay to break laws but it's okay to break rules and and i i i was able to be a lot more candid with them and and that's when i realized that a lot of these things that you kind of learn in school you then have to unlearn later in life right and and that doesn't mean like necessarily that school failed right because school serves a certain broader purpose than just like you know optimizing your income or title or anything of that sort right like there are many goals to the school system so it doesn't mean that like you know school did a terrible job necessarily but it does mean that you have to be cognizant of it you have to just like be aware of what you might need to unlearn because i find a lot of people who done extremely well for the first 22 years 24 years of their life they struggle in the workplace because they and for decades they struggle and they have no idea why and so the question is are you willing to unlearn some of these things yeah and uh, you know adam grant has a good book about that that i recommend highly on how to how to unlearn i think unlearning over the next 20 years is going to become a much more valued and useful talent than learning because things are changing so much and there's a lot of people well i wish there were more but one can point to a fairly good group of people who are voraciously curious and want to learn it gets to be a much smaller segment and cohort about people who understand that they have to actively unlearn because things that you learned maybe 15 or 20 years ago are no longer true. Mm-hmm. And and I love this idea that you have of the 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 feedback thing. What I would add to that though is that I have in in asset management we call that temporal arbitrage, right? So temporal ar- arbitrage is exactly the made up this crazy word that you're supposed to impress people with all it means is you're willing to invest over much longer cycles than other people and guess what if you do you're going to do a lot better and you actually put it in your thing you know when you get these short feedback loops it starts to affect how you think about things and it's like you know i think that for the most part these these uh, smartphones are are definitely they added a ton but generationally like i don't know many of my contemporaries so i'm 62 years old i don't know many of my contemporaries who use this as their primary window into the world okay i think that's a generational thing i do it when i'm traveling or i don't have an ipad or a laptop with me mm-hmm. but but i don't scroll right i don't like and you know it's really interesting if you want to dive into how some of these companies are optimized uh, like you know not great let's put it that way but what they're doing is they're they're optimizing for that and if people aren't doing that they they interact with your app in a very very different way but one of the things that you may, that you point out is and and that I want to underline is that if you're caught in a in a short feedback cycle it becomes very easy to miss out on the idea that the things that you might be doing now and will be doing over the next say 5 or 10 years are often the things that lead to the massive impact like 12 years from now and if you if you have gotten hooked on this instant flywheel and it's always you know for 15 seconds okay got another one got another one you really it's like one of the things like you can think what you want about him but one of the things that i thought was pretty cool about jeff bezos was that clock he's the atomic clock that he's building and if he's still doing that because it was like underlining the the message that you know these these tiny short periods of time on a longer term objective can can lead you astray it reminded me of of William Blake who I like very much and he, his quote was i must create a system of my own or be enslaved by another man's mm-hmm. and 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 i think that like not intending to not intending to so let's take malice or anything away 
society itself, but schools and many of the institutions in society without intending to put like the wrong lessons into people. And thus it becomes important to unlearn. Thus it becomes important to be curious. Thus it's important to say, I don't know. Let me see if, if I can look into that. Which leads me into like, the reason I left this to last was because if I knew if I started with it, we would just spend the entire show talking about the Tao Te Ching by Lao Tzu. But it's been a passion of mine since I was 18. I cannot tell you the number of times that I've read it. I own every single translation into English. I think I might be missing one or two. But you did a great thread on you know taking lessons away from the Tao Te Ching. And I think that I'd just like you to, to highlight some of them because you took away some that I hadn't yet. And I thought that that was very cool. Like, like I've learned most of these, but how, how did you, how, A, how did you become interested in the Tao Te Ching? And, and then B, did you actively, were you always actively looking for, huh, I wonder how that could make me a better person? Yeah, you know, it's it's funny how, what my experience has been with the Tao Te Ching, which is, I think I picked it up like maybe in my 20s. I was a kind of voracious reader. And so, of course, I stumbled across it somewhere. And Jim, I read it and I'm like, I don't get it. Like, I just, I don't get it. And it was also at the age where I think if I did not understand something, I attributed fault to the other. <laughs> right? I, I not yet learned that, you know, uh, when when the Dutch man or woman move. is ready, the book <laughs> arrives, right? Like, it's, it's kind of right. like, you know, sometimes, you know, you have to grow into the book and the book doesn't owe you anything. <laughs> and so, so it's like, ah, oh, okay, people talk about it, but I don't know. And then I went through my life journey, whatever it was, you know, through my 20s, 30s, and you know, early 40s. And then I think it was maybe three years ago, I kind of took another look at the book. And this time it was an entirely different experience. Right? I still don't pretend to understand all the 81 or so chapters or sections. So I think I still have a lot of work to do, but there were some that like very clearly resonated and they resonated because I learned about them organically through hard experience. And, and, and then it's so beautifully, and no matter what translation you, you choose to read, like it's so beautifully Beautiful. captured yeah. in, in such like compact ways. And so so anyway, like that, that was my experience with this, you know, I kind of almost read it 20 years after I first encountered it and a completely different experience. And one thing I realized is that, you know, a lot of what is said there is, is about contemporary leadership, actually. Right. So like, but, but it's, it sometimes uses language that may deter us from, you know, really paying attention to it. So for instance, it was written when I assume like, you know, kings and queens were like ruling over, you know, ruling over large cities and countries and whatnot. Yeah. And so, you know, I, I just want to like highlight one specific, I, I think it's like chapter 17 and it's, a, it's, it's about invisible leaders, right? But the way it's written is like, it talks about rulers, right? Like, so like the, it says, if a ruler lacks faith, so will the people. And, and then it keeps using the term ruler. And I asked myself, like, actually, what if I just replace the word ruler with leader? And, and, and then the, the, that one chapter essentially encompassed about 10 years of my journey as a manager and leader, which is this idea. And I'm just going to, you know, I brought it up to, so I could kind of just share it with the listeners. It says, unworthy leaders are despised. Common leaders are feared by their subjects. Good leaders win the affection and praise of their subjects, or you can say people, right? Substitute subjects with people. But here's the most profound part, which is, but when great leaders lead, the people are hardly aware of their existence. 
Yeah, the translation that I remember the most is for that last line, the 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 people say, look, we did this ourselves, mm-hmm. which is also a nice, a nice meaning. Yep. Yep. And and I think it's, it's just like that, you know, I started my journey as a leader, being a terrible leader. I was a horrible, I, I don't think I was a very good manager. And and then only in the last five-ish years of an operating role, I think I became a good manager to a point at some point, like I was kind of seen as among the best managers in, at the company. And like people would come to me for kind of like mentorship on management and leadership. And that that journey essentially involved understanding this, which is there are many different ways to lead. You can be the visible leader, but like what the one that resonated most with me was that of an invisible leader, right? Like I like to work behind the scenes and get people to align towards the vision, right? Like, and, and, and when you do that, and when you successfully look, do that, it looks like magic. It looks like inception, right? Like, because they think it's their ideas and they kind of are right. Like all I did is kind of probe and prompt and ask the right questions. And then the right idea emerged. And all I did is kind of nudge them in the right direction. But now they own it, right? And and yes, I'm not going to necessarily get the same credit versus if I were a visible leader. But that's because our organizations are flawed today, right? Like, so I don't need to necessarily change myself and my approach and what really resonates with me and what brings me joy simply to yield to you know, the imperfect way or the, you know, suboptimal way in which organizations operate today, I would rather be an invisible leader, right? And like, again, this was written, whatever it was, several thousand years ago. And yet these core principles remain the same. They they absolutely are. And you, you quoted a verse that I think very highly of. And trying to get people who don't think like that to understand to certain things that I view as elemental, I'll give you an example. So when I rolled out of Bear Stearns to form my third company, independent, owned by me and others, we were coming up with trading systems, right? And and so the president of my company and a couple other high-ranking people, they're like, we've really got to make a decision on all of these trading and information systems. And I'm like, sorry, wait, what? And they repeated themselves. We, you know, we've got to come up with what we want to buy. And I'm like, we're not coming up with anything. And like, I looked at one of them and I said, what was the last time you traded anything? It was probably the same time with me. And we used an Excel spreadsheet because a bunch of money was coming into our new, lo- you know, our new no load funds in 1998. <laughs> so I like, I try to get the idea that push these decisions down to the people who actually are using the tools that you are trying to make, that you as the owner want to make them most effective. But it blew me away at how many people, senior people, and not just in what we do, but in, in a variety of endeavors, think that they should you know, promulgate on high the way this needs to be, which I think is absurd. If, if we accept the idea that most systems that we're dealing with are complex adaptive systems, top down doesn't work in a complex adaptive system. Emergence comes from the bottom of a complex mm-hmm. adaptive system. And, and so it's kind of like you had another one on here, which I really, really resonated with, which, which you put it in a way that I hadn't put it. So I loved it and wrote it down. Tight grip, weakest grip. Fantastic. Explain a little bit about that one. Yeah. And so, you know, a a lot of us think as a leader, we are supposed to, you know, just like have control over everything. And, you know, that's the way to go. That's what you're supposed to do as a sort of good leader. Right. But what I found is that like, and, and actually it turns out that that is, not bad advice. It might even be very good advice for some organizations. But if you are creating an organization where like, you're actually doing what most organizations say, but never do, which is like, you're hiring the best people, whatever right. the definition of best is, and you're creating a great culture, a collaborative culture, whatever, like your know, culture of creativity and, you know, mission oriented work and progress. If you are in fact doing that, then the tight grip is 
giving you it's addressing your need which is your need for a sense of control and in, in some cases if we go down to like deeper psychology insecurities and what not it is addressing that but it is actually not addressing it is not enabling you to fulfill the mission of your organization because if you have these great people immersed in this amazing cultural substrate then wouldn't the right thing to do be would be to give them the ability and agency to come up with the best ideas and to like give them a lot of execution freedom and of course again as a leader you will be best positioned to set a vision right like you will be best positioned to to uh, you know perhaps even you know create a strategy that resonates with everybody because you have that kind of holistic view but and by all means have a very tight grip when it comes to the vision right but after that let go and then magic happens absolutely true and very consistent with the taoist idea of wu wi actionless activity and and when you try to explain that to people who are not tuned into it it's it's a it's very much at odds with the way people think we ought to to go well as i worried i'm i'm already 20 minutes over what my time limit is supposed to be the nice thing is this is my podcast i can do whatever i want but i also have another engagement that i have to get ready for so a i didn't even cover like a full 50% of what i wrote down which is always good that means that we really had a great discussion but b that also means that you're going to have to put up with me reinviting you to cover the other half when when we get an opportunity yes so if you listen to us you do know my final question and you even alluded to it earlier we're going to pretend that inception is true and that i'm going to let you become an earworm you can't kill anyone you can't put anyone in a reeducation camp but i'm going to hand you a magical microphone and you're going to say two things into it and the next morning whenever morning comes to the 7 plus billion human beings on the planet currently they're all going to wake up and they're going to say i just had this great dream or i just had this great idea and i'm going to do that what two things are you going to incept in, in the rest of the population I love inception. So number 1, don't avoid books and discard books or reject books because of title that doesn't resonate with you. There's so many books Jim that I've encountered that have uh, what seems or is popularly sort of you know referenced as oh this is a terrible title. Like I'll give you one example which gets cited a lot on Twitter which is the courage to be disliked and it's a book about adlerian psychology and it's just like one of the five books that were life changing for me sure uh, and and again it was the right time in in my in my life that i read read those ideas and like drastically changed how i approach my life from that point forward and a lot of people just like have an allergic reaction to that title yeah. because they like you know they they think it's some self help mumbo jumbo and it's not it's really practical and those ideas are just like profound high impact and highly counterintuitive and yet people just reject that so like that's an example of a book that like doesn't necessarily have the most appealing title according to some but is just an exceptional book i'll share another one as well which is if you're interested in strategy business strategy product strategy you've got to read understanding michael porter by uh, john magreta Uh, yeah, and too. again the title understanding michael porter like you probably saw it at a barnes and noble or a bookstore you probably wouldn't pick it up right it's it's like the only thing you need to really deeply understand okay. strategy and it's explained so well so like that would be my number one love it uh, number two would be i think the best way i can describe it is be more like george costanza and so like uh, i'm like you know seinfeld is like I, I, most... so yeah so i'm laughing <laughs> because i was going to drop a costanza thing on you i love it <laughs> oh i love it yeah so so seinfeld is my favorite show of i've watched it like six times every episode and george costanza although portrayed as the fool in 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 the series is actually the wise one right like if you if you look at it in, in a certain way so like and what i specifically mean perhaps in what i might perhaps incept if i were to incept with one idea there which is is an episode of seinfeld where 
George realizes that like basically he's he's kind of in the pit of despair and everything in his life has like not amounted to anything whatsoever. And so Jerry Seinfeld suggests to him as his friend that well, if you know every instinct you've had is wrong, then the opposite of that instinct would be the correct one. And so that creates a mini epiphany for George Costanza. And so if, for the duration of that episode, he does the opposite of what his in- instinct tells him to do. And he actually encounters great success, right? Yeah. And so the reason I bring this up is because I think this is the best way to avoid binary thinking, right? Like, so what, like my message really is like, learn to think gray. But I think the way you can start to think gray is, you know, really sit with the opposite of your beliefs for one day a year. Oh, right? such great and, advice. And, and what it might do is it won't take you to the opposite. So don't fear that. Don't fear losing a sense of identity, but I hope that it will take you from where you are here, which is the other end of the opposite to like somewhere in between. And I think that it's that empathy. It's that awareness that we need in the world today. I could, I could not agree with that more. And I love that. I'm I'm going to steal that from you too, Uh, because I also love, I was talking with somebody yesterday and we Seinfeld came up and I said, you, I think could develop a semester long course using just Seinfeld in whatever field you were teaching. So if you're yep. teaching psychology, you can you can do it for Seinfeld. If you're teaching investment or asset allocation, you can do it with Seinfeld. And and so we started laughing pretty heartily and, and that particular episode came up and just brilliant, brilliant. They they touched on so much of life and for someone my age, what's even more fascinating to me is they did that when it was still dangerous. Hmm. You, you didn't talk about masturbation on network TV. And of course, one of the classic is the bet, right? Where, yeah, right. Yeah. where they, they never say, they never <laughs> say the word, but it's very <laughs> obvious what, what's happening. And it was, it's just so funny. And, and then I just made me start thinking about the fact that you know, really, and of course, that's Larry David too. Mm-hmm. Uh, but that they, they really, really mined some. They they were the first to put the hoe in the ground and 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 pull up the earth for a lot of things. Well, listen, this has been more than fun. You exceeded my expectations. <laughs> Do you want me to ask you where I think you're going to be in five years? <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Please, Jim, tell tell me all the steps along the way as well. <laughs> Listen, how can uh, how can our listeners know more about you? We're going to have a lot of stuff in the show notes, but Twitter, the easiest place for them to find you? Yeah, you can f- follow me on Twitter. I'm just at Shreyas, S-H-R-E-Y-A-S. So that, uh, you'll find all sorts of thoughts there around psychology, organizations, product management, and life sometimes. And if you don't have Twitter, follow me on LinkedIn. I'm increasingly you know, posting more on LinkedIn as well on that community. So, so that's a great place to follow some of my thoughts as well. And then for those of you, your listeners who are in tech, uh, uh, later this year, I'm going to be offering some courses around how to make successful products happen. And, and I'm very excited about that because I'm trying to target this to, you know, uh, folks who are like, you know, fairly advanced in their careers and who are looking to create really outsized outcomes uh, through the products they work on and do so uh, with non-consensus, but in my opinion, correct ideas. So that's something I'm actively working on. So just stay tuned for that as well. Exciting. I'll have you back on and we'll just talk about that and some of the things that I didn't get to. Thank you so much. This was a delight for me and thanks for coming on. Yeah, this was a blast and happy to have another conversation anytime, June.